I have to tell you, Donnie Schreibman. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me in this uh, lecture. Um, the topic is somewhat interesting. Uh, it's Liszt and Thalberg. This is a modern caricature, but it kind of depicts already the differences. We all know the stories of Liszt. We all know that um, the legends about Liszt, and there's quite a lot of extensive information exists about Liszt, but how much do we really know about Thalberg? Not so much. Thalberg was known as the perfect pianist of some sorts. He would play almost motionless, as you can see in the caricature, it's perfectly depicting it, while Liszt would be the flamboyant, electrifying pianist that would show off basically on every account. Thalberg's probably most uh, famous aspect of his playing was actually his tone quality. A lot of uh, connoisseurs and critics alike would always call Thalberg's tone as a singing tone. Even Schumann famously said about Thalberg, um, he has a melodiousness of his own. Now, Thalberg, we know that he um, was the great rival of Liszt. And another aspect that Thalberg is famous for is, of course, the three-hand effect, which I will talk about very soon. But it's their origins. So Thalberg was born in Switzerland in January 8th, 1812, just a mere two and a half months after Liszt was born. However, it's the circumstances of his birth that are misleading. According to Alan Walker, the birth certificate state, clearly states that his father is Joseph Thalberg and his mother, Fortuna Stein. Both uh, parents are Jews from Far Frankfurt am Main, and he was born into a regular Jewish family. However, there are some indications, especially during Thalberg's time, that he was in fact the illegitimate son of Prince Dichterstein and Baroness von Matzler, Metzler. Sorry. And the fact that he never really disputed that, even though the rumors only circulated more and more during his uh, flamboyant, I would say, reputation as a pianist, uh, he never disputed that fact. He actually lived up to it. He would always dress up as almost aristocratically. He would behave himself on stage very uh, aristocratically and with poise which again shows the difference between Liszt and Thalberg. This is, for example, uh, two characters uh, from different times, of course, but this is Liszt's character from a uh, Paris newspaper around 1886, around the year of his death. Um, and this is Thalberg probably in the late 1840s at the peak of his uh, performing career. Again, you can see that Liszt is always depicted as this big electrifying piano destroyer, I would call him, because he is known to have destroyed a lot of pianos. In fact, there is one account, for example, in Vienna in 1838, where Liszt performed, he had to replace three pianos in one concert, including Thalberg's borrowed uh, Erard piano. So, Thalberg, on the other hand, was as gentle as a feather when it came to playing the piano. And he produced the most beautiful tones uh, ever heard at that time. Clara Schumann famously said of Thalberg, he does not fail a single note. His passages can be compared to rows of pearls, and his octaves are the most beautiful ones I have ever heard. Just to know that the the rivalry between the, the two was not in effect until Thalberg arrived to Paris in 1835. This is about almost the same time that he arrived to Paris. When Thalberg came to Paris, he was already was famous all over Europe. He just um, became a commer virtuose uh, to the emperor in Vienna in 1834, and 
his reputation in England was already exceeding any other uh, pianist. He had studied with Ignaz Moscheles in England. Um, now, Thalberg's reputation was not enough, because when he arrived to Paris, it was filled with all great pianists. People like Henry Hertz, for example, or Friedrich Kalkbrenner, the ruling king of Paris at that time, uh, that kind of took Thalberg under his wing to be his successor, for Thalberg to be his successor. Now, other pianists arrived, and there's accounts of great pianists like uh, Ferdinand Hiller, uh, a Jewish uh, pianist who was a close friend of Mendelssohn, who also performed a lot in Paris. And for example, Alexander Dreyschuk, who was also a very famous Bohemian pianist. And he was famous, for example, for his octaves. Allegedly, he would perform every concert as an encore, the revolutionary etude of Chopin with the left hand playing all in octaves never really losing the speed, according to some accounts. So Thalberg wasn't the only one. List at that point, if you don't know, escaped in some ways to Geneva, actually, to Switzerland, because of his affair with Marie Dagou. The family had a big dispute, and they had to leave Paris to kind of cool down the environment. List had no idea that Thalberg arrived to Paris and took the city by a storm. When Thalberg performed in Paris, very quickly, the critics, as well as the audience, divided into two groups. You had the Listians, who were very loyal to Liszt and thought of Liszt as the uh, prime pianist, the greatest pianist, such as Hector Berlioz, for example. Uh, and you've had the Thalbergians uh, that saw Thalberg as the new generation of pianists, the greatest pianist, and more importantly, the future of piano. Liszt was still very much flamboyant. He was still giving concerts in Switzerland. He traveled also to Lyon just before he arrived to Paris. And then when he arrived to Paris and he heard of this big news of Thalberg basically already crowned the jewel of the city, he famously, or allegedly he, uh, gave a very, very, um, I would say, demeaning review about Talbert's music. In fact, that was Marie Dagou, using her pseudonym, uh, Daniel Stern, she published an article where she called Talbert's music worthless. Of course, that was just the spark. The press, like I said, only elevated that. People demanded a duel. And throughout the, the entire 1836 season, each pianist basically elevated the idea of one of them must be the best. Therefore, there must be a duel. It was only inevitable. When the duel happened, another character, when the duel happened in 1837, uh, March 31st, 1837, at the Princess Belgioioso Palace. Um, it was quite a spectacle, at which at the end, the princess said that Thalberg is the first pianist in the world, but Liszt is unique, meaning nobody can be compared to Liszt. A somewhat, I would say, diplomatic conclusion. But the duel itself is really something unique even to this day, if we would compare the duel to something modern, if it would be, let's say, a sport event, it would be like the rumble in the jungle, Muhammad Ali against George Foreman. Everybody in the world were tuned in, basically. Anybody who's anybody wanted to be there. In fact, the tickets were so expensive that the princess allowed herself to uh, put 40 francs per ticket, which was a lot of money back then. Um, or I would say it was like the battle between two action movie figures, Arnold Schwarzenegger versus Sylvester Stallone, if you want. Uh, but anyways, the duel basically cemented the fact that both of them are equally great. Both of them are equally unique. And it's for that time, for that period of time, the end of the 1830s and early 1840s, both of them basically ruled over Europe. Thalberg usually preceded Liszt in every country 
Talberg came to Russia before Liszt came to Russia and gave concerts. Talberg went to um, uh, England again, gave concerts before Liszt did his tour. They were in fact giving the same tour in Spain and Portugal in 1844. But Talberg still managed to gather more audiences than Liszt did in some accounts. This caricature, for example, um, of Liszt from 1873 depicts the four stages of his performing. So the beginning, quiet, mysterious on the left, and then the most emotional parts where he's overly emotional. Then we have the turbulent on the bottom left, and of course, the humble bow. Whereas Thalberg, with a caricature around the, uh, the time of his death, actually, in 1871, is again somewhat very calm with fingers just going on the keyboard. This duel created a lot of um, disputes. It was before the War of the Romantics in, in the lecture that we've heard just today. Um, so it was kind of the beginnings of it. One has to remember that both Schumann's, Clara and Robert, Mendelssohn, and other more uh, reserved and classicist musicians and composers, they thought very highly of Thalberg from the basically get-go. So Thalberg was in high esteem even more, I would say, than Liszt was, which is not surprising. Schumann quite obviously declared himself as a classicist, so did Brahms, yet his, their music is very much romantic. Thalberg was also a very conventional classicist in the manner of Mendelssohn and Hummel and uh, uh, Weber before him. Thalberg's music overall is nowadays especially judged according to one uh, thing, which is the paraphrases, the opera paraphrases and fantasies. We all know that Thalberg had this three-hand effect that he, he took into uh, under his wing in a way as his calling card, with majority of his pieces had that effect. Most famous probably example is the Moses fantasy, uh, based on the uh, Moses opera by Rossini, which was very, very popular at that time, and which he played in the duel as well. However, there is more to Thalberg than just opera paraphrases. So to give you an example, what is the three-hand effect? This is, for example, just a short excerpt. I'm not going to play this. Uh, it's quite difficult. Uh, <laughs> As you can clearly see, the middle staff is actually the theme, where the right hand and the left hand go about the piano with long arpeggios, sometimes all over the keyboard, back and forth, while the thumbs take care of the theme. Thalberg did that very successfully to the point that audiences would rise up from their chairs just to see if it's actually one person who's playing the piano, and not more. Uh, the effect was accomplished by very careful um, control of the pedal of the piano. So in a way, both the instrument development and the pianist came together at the right time at the right place. If Thalberg, let's say, would have been born 10 years earlier, it's doubtful that he would be able to create this effect 10 years earlier. The pianos of the time would not allow it. Now, the three-hand effect and the three-staff writing, which was very unique at that time, Schumann does not have any music that has clearly three staffs breaking. He has Isaiah staff, which is quite common for romantic composers, but he doesn't have this kind of writing. This was unique. However, these aspects are not invented by Thalberg, contrary to usual belief. The norm and the acceptance of the facts nowadays conclude that it was Elias Parrish Alvers, uh, English harpist, as Berlioz uh, once depicted him as the list of the harp. He was, in fact, probably the first one to create that effect of three hands, but on the harp. As you can clearly, he, uh, clearly see, he has the melody going in the middle voice while long arpeggios go between both hands, both staffs, up and down. 
This actually predates Stahlberg's first uses of the three-hand effect in his pieces, like the Moses fantasy. Uh, most likely that Thalberg heard Elias um, in a concert in Vienna when Elias gave a tour throughout Europe in the early 1830s, and he was influenced by it. However, we don't really have substantial evidence to it, so we can only speculate. Now, the three staff writing was, again, not invented by Thalberg. Even though Thalberg did use it quite a lot, it was not his invention. I'm sure none of you have heard of a composer named Francesco Pollini. Francesco Pollini was an um, Austrian-Roman uh, pianist and teacher, same generation as um, Muzio Clementi. And he was already in his elder age when he composed this. He had quite a few piano pieces, most of them in the manner of exercises, very much unknown nowadays. And this is, for example, an exercise in the form of a toccata that he composed around 1820, which is about 15 good years before Thalberg's Moses Fantasy, for example. Um, and you can clearly see three staff writing. That was a unique feature, not really done before. Although in here, the melody is on the top rather than the middle. So somewhat of an innovation. Now, to say that Thalberg's music only goes according to the three-hand effect, or only really is depicted through his paraphrases and fantasies of famous operas, is to wrongdo the, the music of Thalberg in many ways. His original music is what really, uh, in my opinion, matters, rather than his paraphrases and opera transcriptions. This is the sonata, the first pages of the sonata. As I said, Thalberg was a classicist. He was very conventional in his way of composition. In fact, he studied with Simon Sector, who was a very famous uh, uh, fugue and, and theory teacher and harmony teacher in Vienna, um, who among his students were also Anton Bruckner, who was probably his most famous student. So Thalberg knew the, the correct ways of counterpoint, and he used that a lot in his earlier pieces. But then after a lot of criticisms, including by Schumann, that the music is not interesting, he tuned it down. Nevertheless, he kept the traditional forms very much intact. On one hand, we have the liberal fantasies and paraphrases that were very common at that time. But on the other hand, we have the conventional classicist forms of a sonata form, for example. Thalberg only wrote one sonata. And apart from his piano concerto, this is his single large-scale work. Liszt, as we know, wrote a lot of large-scale works. But he also wrote technically only one sonata. The Dante Fantasia Quasi Sonata is not always considered to be a sonata, more like a fantasy. However, it is in the form of a sonata. For the sake of argument and for the sake of the length of this lecture, I will focus just on Liszt Sonata in comparison. However, Liszt Sonata was written much later than Thalberg's. It is unknown if Liszt knew Thalberg's Sonata. It is unknown if Thalberg heard List Sonata when it came out in 1854. Thalberg Sonata was published only by two publishers in 1845. He composed it in 1844. There is no manuscript in existence, unfortunately, or at least it's lost. But only two publishers published it, the Breitkopf and Hurdle in Leipzig and the Schlesinger in Paris. List Sonata, of course, over the course of, of the century was published by all the major publication houses of Europe. I would go on a limb and say that Thalberg's Sonata is overlooked and it's a real shame. Thalberg's original compositions are much more interesting and much better done compositionally wise than his opera transcriptions. The opera transcriptions are usually simple enough for people to enjoy it. Not so simple for people to play it but definitely simple enough to enjoy. But it's really the opera influence on Thalberg 
just to say as a side note, Thalberg married the daughter of a very famous tenor um, uh, in Paris, and he also tried to compose two operas. Well, he did compose them, but they were unfortunately uh, failed attempts when they were produced, one in England and one in Vienna. Nevertheless, he surrounded himself around opera to the point that every melody that he had was almost like an opera. Very melodical, as I said, Thalberg's reputation was all about the melodies that he created, the beauty of his sound. Liszt said of him, for example, that the only man that I know is Thalberg who can play the piano like the violin. So, gives a lot about Thalberg's abilities, both as a pianist and as a composer, in my opinion. Now, the sonata, as opposed to Liszt sonata, it starts with a clear statement, like I said, very classical, uh, of the key of the sonata, of the idea of the sonata. It starts from a uh, short introduction that quickly lead, leads into the main theme that is restated again in the full blast forte. Thalberg does that a lot. In fact, he was criticized by many critics for being repetitive or being too simplistic that he takes a theme that is very simple, four bar theme or eight bar theme, and he just repeats it one more time. But hey, they said that Schubert is boring and repetitive as well. And we now know that how of a genius he is, so. Let me play the opening so that you can slightly hear at least some of Thalberg's genius. And in the opening, he, you can clearly see one thing that is very hard to accomplish really fast in, on the piano, and not every pianist can do that very easily, is the tenths in the left hand. In the third system, quite a lot of tenths, and then again, it's restated in the second page. Thalberg was known to be able to take tense very easily. Chopin said of him, he, takes, he plays tense as I play octaves. So whether or not Thalberg had a large hand, it is unknown, but he definitely was able and capable of playing tense quite easily. So he used tense quite a lot in his music. And I think, in my opinion, that's what really scares pianists, both in those days and nowadays from his original works, because of the technical difficulty to play. Not every pianist would be inclined to try and tackle such demanding span. Liszt, for example, also used tense, but much less. Liszt, in many ways, in many regards, thought of the performer that would play his pieces rather than himself. In other words, Liszt thought about how many people would be able to play it. And as Liszt, as generous as he was, I would say, he thought of every pianist that he knew about. So anybody could play it, or at least majority of the pianists. Thalberg, however, it seems, was composing mostly for himself. Nevertheless, it is unknown if Thalberg ever even performed the sonata. Even on his American tour, which is something that Liszt never did, um, he never performed. There are programs in existence that were left in archives, but there's no mention of the sonata. So we don't really know if he even ever performed his single large-scale piece. He did perform his concerto, but never the sonata. Now to compare the two sonatas is quite simply comparing between the earth and the sky, I would say. 
One is a very classical and, and very restricted, I would say, in the form, and Liszt is very free and modernist and really kind of broke the boundaries of form, especially classical form like the sonata. But for the sake of argument, let's see the differences. Liszt sonata, as you probably know, starts from nothing. We don't know what key are we in, where are we going, what is going on, Yet Liszt presents already the main three motives, especially the two that he uses the most in the entire sonata, already in the first page. As opposed to Thalberg being classically trained, presents the first theme properly, restates it, then there's a transition that leads to the secondary theme, which I will show you uh, in a bit. I even heard an account of explaining the beginning of the sonata as such. The rest in the beginning is basically in the beginning, there was nothing. And then, G, God spoke. <laughs> I've heard that. So, and there are other accounts of famous teachers applying names of their own teachers to intimidate students. There's one account about uh, Yaakov Zak, who was a very famous Soviet uh, teacher. And his students would constantly say about the sonata that it starts from his name. Zack. <laughs> Zack. I'll show you. many, many accounts of how to interpret this piece, and this piece was used in so many uh, lectures and, and essays and writings that it's probably one of the most written about pieces of all time. Buzzoni, for example, famously claimed uh, to his students and other students uh, that attended his master class by saying that if a pianist doesn't play this by the age of 18, they won't become a concert pianist. I guess we're all late. Uh, <laughs> Liszt presents the, th the, the main motives, the two main motives uh, in the Allegro Energico, uh, really one after another, without any kind of transitions, without any kind of delay. with me. These two motives, they reappear and reused in every possible way throughout the entire piece. The entire sonata is based on, majority uh, of it is based on these two motives, even though he has, as I said, the first one, the beginning, which is restated a couple more times in the middle section and of course at the end. And later on he has the fourth and the fifth motives which uh, the fourth appears with the big chords in the fortissimo, which if some of you know, and then the fifth is much, much later in technically the development section or the middle section. Now, when we think about Thalberg, going back to Thalberg, as I said, his ways of composition is first and foremost about the melody. So he always thought about what is, how beautiful a melody is. He always thought of creating an operatic melody in every single melody of his. For example, this is the secondary theme in the first movement of his sonata, starting from that choral section that says semplice above it in piano, which I'm about to play. And you can clearly hear, even though it's in a way formal, because it's choral, it has this operatic 
feel to it, at least in my opinion. And then it goes to a repeated section of, the main, of this theme, but now with a little bit more dancing quality to it. Does it feel operatic to you? No, it has a feel to it. Now, I will play more themes, but I want to stop a little bit before I will continue with the themes and point out, go back to the fact that he studied with Simon Sector, so he was very much fluent with proper counterpoint. However, as I said, he was criticized for it in his earlier pieces, like in his Opus 12, uh, A Fantasy, uh, in which he overused the counterpoint using a lot of fugal places, something that, for example, Liszt very famously used in his sonata. So instead, he decided to use short canon-like moments, which occur quite often in this piece, mainly in the first movement, but also in other movements. So it starts from the piano in F major, and you can clearly see it starts in the second system, fourth bar, it starts from A, E, F, G, and then the line restates in the middle voice, A, E, F, G, and then the top voice comes in. As you can see, it has quite a lot of leaps in the left hand. Some of them are over a tenth. Again, it's not something that only Thalberg did. Liszt is quite known for his leaps. If you don't know about Liszt's leaps, I would suggest to listen to the Contrabandista uh, piece, which is quite famously known and is considered to be one of the hardest pieces written for the piano. Surprisingly enough, quite forgotten nowadays. Um, but as I said, Thalberg was known for his span, so he would be able to take all of these with very much ease, and he would not move a muscle, not, would, not even an eyelash would move. When I think about themes and with Thalberg, I also, in a way, compare Thalberg to Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn being a classicist and a very conventional uh, uh, composer, and Mendelssohn knew Thalberg. In fact, Mendelssohn was influenced by Thalberg's so-called three-hand effect. If you are interested to look at uh, Mendelssohn's Prelude and Fugue in E minor, uh, Opus 35, that he composed in 1842, uh, the prelude is literally the entire piece is just a three-hand effect with a theme being in the middle. So Thalberg in a way, was also influenced by Mendelssohn. This second movement, Scherzo Pastoral, which might be looked at as a scherzo a la Chopin, but in fact, it's more like a gondola piece by uh, a song without words by Mendelssohn. The theme is very easygoing, very simplistic. It's repeated, as I said. He repeats himself a lot, which doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. I always think that uh, if it's good, why not repeat it? 
Um. This little part, and overall this second movement, personally it's my favorite. Because Thalberg really shows off, I would say, with his harmonical skills. As you heard in the last part, he switches between harmonies very quickly. If we look back at the Baroque era, for example, Handel was very famous for that. Switching the harmonies within one bar at least three times, four times. Whereas Liszt always keeps the same harmony could keep it for bars and bars. Something to ponder about. Now, speaking of switching harmonies, it's the middle section that is the most, I would say, elaborate in that regard. The B section of the scherzo has a very beautiful, in my opinion, the most beautiful theme of the sonata, opera-like thematic idea, but it's the transition that leads to it that is really harmonically interesting. He starts from F major, which eventually will lead to B flat major of the B theme, but try to think, where is F major in all those chords? <laughs> goes away. And the B theme starts. Now the B theme is restated only twice in the entire piece, one after another. The first time is very much almost as if it's just one singer singing with the orchestra being uh, accompanimental in the background. And then the second time with a full-fledged forte and fortissimos, as if the entire orchestra is playing the theme rather than just the singer alone. And it goes away into another transition that eventually leads back to the main theme. The third movement, again, shows Thalberg's skills as a melodic composer. As I said, the melody to Thalberg was everything. This time, it's way in the bottom.
Very operatic, as I said. He restates this melody exactly the same manner, however, in the entire sonata, he doesn't use his calling card. He doesn't use his most famous technical pyrotechnic effect, the three-hand effect. He only does it once and only to a smaller scale version of it when the theme reappears towards the end of the third movement. Not the first movement and definitely not the brilliant and very chaotic almost fourth movement have that effect. That leads to the end of the third movement. Now before I go to the final, to the grand finale agitato, I want to go back to Liszt, because I've been stuck, I think, on Thalberg for quite a while now. Now, Liszt, as you can see, lots and lots of octaves. Liszt's calling card, at least nowadays, he's most famous for octaves, even though he wasn't really the only one. As I said about Dreyschuk, for example, that was really his only reputation, the octaves. But nevertheless, Liszt uses octaves, fast octaves, alternating octaves, um, broken martellato-like octaves, and of course, leaping arpeggios and, and, and jumps of octaves. Uses that almost in every major piece of his. If we take the large-scale original works, the Valet d'Obermann, the Dante, Fantasia Quasi Sonata, and the Sonata itself, they all have lots and lots of octaves. In a way, Liszt wanted also to show off in his Sonata. Is it gonna block? Can you still see the bottom? Okay, then it works. Now, before I play those blistering octaves, which is always a hassle and quite a uh, place to look forward to whenever a performer is performing, just to see, oh, how many mistakes will they have? Um, what I really want to focus on is two things. In the very beginning of the blistering octaves in the fortissimo, the third bar of the first system on the left side page, you clearly see a little cannon going on. Again, something that both composers used in very small portions. One hand restates right after the other. Now, a second thing that I would want to point out is the fact that Liszt writes a tenth, unbroken, unarpeggiated tenth in the left hand, which is very uncommon for Liszt's writing. If you look at Liszt's, even the sonata, which does have a few tenths like that, but most of them are actually broken. This is one of the few places where Liszt did not notate it as an arpeggiated or a broken tenth. Doesn't mean that every performer should immediately play it as it is. Most performers, in fact, break it. I guess I'm fortunate enough to take it so I can take it. But nevertheless, it's just to show that Liszt didn't use things, technical features that he knew would be too hard for some pianists. He would prefer to use technical features that would be approachable for majority of the pianists because he wanted his music to be performed. He was, in a way, maybe thinking about the performers, while Thar Thalberg most likely was thinking about himself, or at least for his own music. 
Now that last A is also very significant. Another note that I want to make, no pun intended. Um, that last A was in fact the last A on those pianos. When Liszt composed the piece in 1853, 1852, 1853, the pianos that he had uh, at his possession, including Busendorfer, had in fact that last A. When Thalberg composed his sonata, for example, he had an Erard, that would reach only a C. Both of their pianos would reach the high A rather than the high C, um, which was very rarely used even by Liszt and Thalberg. They reached the G, but not really the A. So in a way, both pianists use the entire range or almost the entire range of the piano. Kind of reminiscing Beethoven, who constantly wanted more and more and asked all the piano builders, I want more. Bring me something bigger. Bring me something louder. And so, Liszt Sonata, I think, form-wise, is most famous for his thematic transformation. In my opinion, at least, it's probably the most significant aspect besides it being a one-movement piece. The thematic transformation is, was not invented by Liszt. Obviously, Schubert, we all know, Wanderer Fantasy, which Liszt loved and performed and even transcribed it for an orchestra and piano, sort of like a piano concerto. But Berlioz also did quite a lot of thematic transformations, especially in his Symphonie Fantastique in 1830. However, I would dare and say that Liszt probably perfected the idea. So the thematic transformation, it leads to the small theme which is based on the third motive. And it becomes later in the median key. That theme is restated just after a couple of um, systems where I stopped, again in here, but this time, and again it comes back to the comparison, or rather the, the statement that I made that Liszt was more influenced from Thalberg's uh, technical ways of writing than vice versa. Liszt does the Thalberg three-hand effect, where the theme is right in the middle, middle voice or the top of the chords, the same theme. Liszt uses this effect again when the, this secondary, well, slow theme, I would call it, um, reappears later in the sonata. But Liszt didn't use it just in these places. Liszt used it, in fact, quite a lot right after he heard it from Thalberg. How many of you know the Norma reminiscences? Quite famous transcription of Liszt. Basically, the entire second half of it is just running arpeggios and running scales with the theme being in the thumbs in the middle. 
On Sospira, for example, concert etude by Liszt, quite often played, very famous, also is basically a three-hand effect. The famous Liebestraum, number three, also quite virtually a three-hand effect technique. So Liszt was very, influ very much influenced by Thalberg, yet Thalberg remained the, the conservative classicist that he was, didn't really use what Liszt innovated and did. For example, things like this in the Liszt sonata you would never see in Thalberg's music. This free, recitativo-like, fantasy-like moments would only appear in Thalberg's music in his opera transcriptions, almost never in any of his original works. Again, because of his very classicist approach to composition. Guess what's coming next after this? More octaves. As I said, Liszt was very famous for octaves, and even nowadays, a lot of students, if you ask any students, what, what's the single first thing that comes to mind when somebody says the word Liszt, immediately people think, oh, octaves. So, in many ways, the Liszt sonata is no doubt a very unique piece, a very modernist piece. It broke really the boundaries of classical forms to a new era of music writing for the piano in larger forms. Remember, Brahms composed his sonatas slightly after Liszt's, uh, sorry, yeah, about the same time slightly after Liszt's sonata, and yet they're very proper, even though some of them are a little bit larger than the usual sonatas with five movements, but nevertheless they're classical in their essence, in the form. Liszt really broke off that tradition. He wasn't the first to do that, but he really perfected the idea. As I said, that is my opinion at least. Thalberg's sonata ends with a bang. His finale agitato is the largest movement, at least in terms of how many notes you need to play, um, in the entire sonata, and it ends about a 35-minute work. So the Thalberg sonata is quite large. And in the last two pages, what I think Thalberg basically summarizes, majority of the techniques that he used throughout the entire sonata. As you can clearly see, he goes from fast scales in the left hand, fast arpeggios in the right hand, then choral uh, patterns, octaves, more arpeggios, as he was nicknamed the old arpeggio by list, uh, and he ends with chords and probably the only place in the sonata where the very last two bars, well, three bars, where he has fast octaves in arpeggiated form. Talbert didn't use that many octaves, not nearly as much as Liz did. Maybe it wasn't his thing. His thing was the three-hand effect, and even that he didn't use in the sonata. He wanted to show originality in the sonata rather than to show special effects. That should be considered when one thinks about Thalberg's original music. This, in other words, or for the lack of a better word, is how you end with a bang.
And if Liszt would have played this, it would look like this. <laughs> Finale furioso, rather than agitato. Um, just as a final note, uh, my point of this lecture is actually to bring more to light Thalberg's music, original music, the sonata specifically, specifically because it's his largest scale work uh, for solo piano. And just to say that the same way that we don't judge Liszt's genius masterworks and genius compositional uh, abilities according to his transcriptions and, uh, and opera fantasies and paraphrases and reminiscences, he composed hundreds of those and yet majority of them even to this day are not played and very rarely uh, to be known about. The same I would say that for Thalberg, you won't judge or you shouldn't judge his music or his abilities as a composer just basing it on his opera transcriptions. In my opinion, he deserves more credit as a composer as I hope to have showed you and maybe with time and openness of both the critical and the musical ears, uh, his music will be more performed, more appreciated, and maybe he will be inducted in the Hall of Fame of the great composers. Thank you. <laughs>